Startup Grind. We have a little tradition here in Startup Grind. Um, everyone take your feet. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is just fantastic. I think this guy is awesome. I like, I like his energy and I love his uh, wisdom. And he came out all the way from Palo Alto this morning just to do this event with us today. And out of the goodness of his heart and his time and his energy, we want to give a rousing welcome. Here, let's hear it. Spencer Tall, Allegis Capital. You love it. <laughs> that cracks me up. He loves it. <laughs> um, well, you guys have seen his bio. Spencer is the manage, managing director of is a managing director of Allegis Capital. He's the general partner and co-founder of APV Technology Partners, co-founder of Asia Pacific Ventures. Almost 20 years in the VC industry. Good experience here, you guys. Um, former operating executive of Asia and US. Speaks fluent and fabulous Japanese. Show, give us a shout out. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him earlier on the phone, and it was, it was really fun. It was really Someone walked by, and they were like, who's this guy? So let's start with just um, open. Talk to us about what's taking you up to the VC place you're at right now, and what's your history there? The first thing you need to understand is that venture is a very strange business. <clears throat> it's not an industry. It's not even a cottage industry. It's very tiny. If you were very generous, you would say that there are maybe 200 venture capital firms that matter. That's being generous, by the way. So if you figure they average four partners apiece, that's maybe a thousand people that are doing venture. <clears throat> and I would say that's worldwide. Now, there are a lot more venture firms than 200, obviously, but they have to be active, you know, early stage venture investors. Because it's so small, that's only a thousand like partner managing director type jobs. You know, there's plenty of support roles and analysts and what have you, but I get a lot of um, young kids coming out of, of MBA programs and they say, gosh, I really want to get into venture. How did you do it? Well, <clears throat> you go raise your own fund because there's no pathway. If you ask 10 VCs how they became venture capitalists, you'll get 10 different answers. And so please keep that in mind that I give you my little simple background. <clears throat> I was born as an entrepreneur um, because I hated being told what to do. And um, so when I was in college, as a freshman in college, I, I took a political science course and I got really interested in that. And I thought, wow, this is really nice. So I made my major political science and then um, I served a, a Mormon mission in Japan for two years. So I learned Japanese. When I came back, I thought, well, gosh, I want to be the ambassador to Japan. That's what I want to be. And so I uh, was going to go into the Foreign Service. I spent um, about six months working for the State Department, actually. And uh, certain three-letter agencies also came a-calling. And I considered all of these different options, <clears throat> but decided that that pathway was never going to lead me to be the ambassador to Japan, because I found out all those guys are political wonks that raise a lot of money and then get you know, the position um, by doing that. And so the only marketable skill I had as a guy with a poli-sci and Japanese degree um, was to either go to graduate school or go work for a Japanese company. Because they're the only ones who would value any skills I had because I didn't have any marketable skills. So I went and worked for two different Japanese companies over about an eight-year period. And the second group I worked for, they're both electronics companies. The second group I worked for was a semiconductor distribution house. And they focused on US semiconductors into the Japan market. What's great about this is this was at the height of the Japan xenophobic period, where everybody in the U.S. thought Japan was going to take over everything. They bought Rockefeller Center. Can you believe it? And everybody's in Foment, you know. They bought Arco Plaza, and so everyone was concerned. And so it was this big, you know, kind of anti-Japanese feeling at the time. And obviously, I was very happy to work for this company was called Marubu, and I was very happy to work for them because we were taking U.S. semiconductors and putting them into into Japanese uh, products. Well, everyone in the U.S. Companies kept trying to hire me to run their, you know, Asia Pac business, and <clears throat> I was afraid I would get pigeonholed as just an Asia guy. So I kept turning them down. But then finally, I said, "Well, what if I did it as a consultant? Because I didn't want to work for anybody. I was tired of being told what to do. I said, what if I did it as a consultant? 
And they said, that would be great. We would be happy to pay you. So I got together with two other guys, and we hung a chandelier called Asia Pacific Ventures. I told my wife, I said, I got really good news. I've doubled my salary. Um, bad news is I don't know if I can pay it, but I've doubled my salary. We have to now get the business to pay that salary. And um, from the get-go, that business exploded. And it was just, this was 1992. The valley was just, just taken off. And... Uh, and we crushed it, and within almost no time, we had 28 people, 12 traveling professionals. We were building about 13 million a year and throwing off tremendous amounts of cash. It was, I went from making nothing to making, actually, as a, as a VC, in terms of current income, not including my carry, I've never made more money than I did as a consultant. It was obscene. Um, so it was great. I was an entrepreneur, and I was doing an MBA at night. I quit because. I, I already have my own company now. Well, I'm not going to finish this program. Um, still had no marketable skills other than I was a pretty good sales guy. Along the way, in 1995, um, we had all these Japanese companies that we were also doing work for in this direction, and some out of, uh, out of Taiwan and Korea as well. And they said, gosh, we're really interested in US technology. Would you guys be interested in helping us find these companies? And most of the companies that we took to Japan were um, startups. And so we already knew the startups, we knew the venture guys, and I looked at the VCs and I thought, gosh, you're not that good. I mean, you're smart, but you're not that good. What we're doing is biz dev. We're really doing real world stuff, helping these companies out. I'll bet I can bridge this gap between the corporates and the VCs. So I went and I raised a venture fund. Now, albeit it was small, it was only $15 million at the time, but became a VC as a result of that. We kept our consulting business for a few years, and then we raised in, uh, <clears throat> in 97, we raised a, another uh, fund, this time it was $85 million, so now I have $100 million under management. I quit doing consulting, kept that business, though. We still had those people running it, but then I was doing full-time VC, and then we raised a third fund after that, under that construct, and that was called APB Technology Partners. So that's how we became a VC, is we went and raised our own money. Because you could do it better than they could. Was that? Because you could do it better than they could. Honestly, this is the funny thing. Um, <laughs> my first three deals all went just, bam, went great. And uh, in fact, the first company I ever invested in was a slow company called Web TV. And I, I put a million and a half dollars in there. It's a $15 million fund, mind you. Put a million and a half bucks in, made 14X in 11 months. What? That was, <laughs> I'm so smart. I know 20 VCs that passed on this deal are so stupid. That I was not, I was absolutely clueless as to what a VC did. And until the bubble burst, you know, in late 2000, early 2001, I really thought I knew what I was doing. I did not. And I found out once the bu bubble burst how poorly I had actually done. Now we had great returns, but that was momentum stuff. And, you know, I had to retrench. In fact, I almost quit venture in <clears throat> 2002. Um, because, I, in fact, I sat down with a good friend of mine, and, and I, I told him, I said, look, I, I, I've never even lost a company before. I've lost four in four months. I really don't know what I'm doing. It scared me to death. Um, and I didn't know what I'd done wrong. And I'd had a lot of success early, so I really needed to do that. So he told me, he said, well, before you make this decision to go back to doing your consulting work, you might want to uh, write down for me the 10 stupidest things you've done. What are the 10 biggest mistakes you've made? And then let's have breakfast tomorrow and discuss them. So I dutifully wrote them all down, and I went to breakfast. His name was Bob Williams. Bob and I sat down. He said, yeah, these are, these are pretty dumb ones. These are pretty dumb mistakes here, whether it be poor syndication or you know, there were a variety of things I did. He said, are you going to make those mistakes again? I said, well, clearly I'm not. He goes, well, then do you want to waste that tuition? Because you've paid your dues now, and while I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, I do have a decent memory, and I have good pattern recognition. And so, yeah, I, I didn't want to make those mistakes again. And I felt like that helped me be a better, better venture capitalist you know, down the road. And so in 2004, well, actually in 2002, the two partners and I that started APV decided we didn't like each other enough to raise a fourth fund together. And so we were all going to do something different. And I was recruited in. They had a partner that was retiring at, at uh, Allegis Capital. And so I was recruited in to help them finish out uh, Fund 4 and then raise Fund 5 and on, on down the road. So I've been with the Legis Capital ever since. So that's how I became a VC. That's awesome. 
Well, one of the things that I really like about Spencer, and I was talking with somebody that knows him well, and this guy has been with several venture firms and knows a lot of different venture firms, and he said, bar none, Spencer is the most hands-on, um, and Allegis is the most hands-on, but particularly Spencer is the most hands-on venture capitalist that he knows. And um, I would love to hear your thoughts about your mentoring and the things you're working with your companies with, because I've heard some great stories and would love to know your process as you approach these companies. When we started at APB, um, we had to change my bed sheets three times a week because I woke up in cold sweat every night. Because I didn't know not only whether I could pay myself, but whether I could pay my team and my people. And even after three years, <clears throat> We always started the next year at ground zero. So in December, we bonus ourselves out, we had a lot of money, but you're only as good as your next deal. And so as an entrepreneur, I knew what that was like in the cold, hard night of the morning to where you got your team, you got to pay for them. And we didn't ever raise venture, we'd done it bootstrap, but I was an entrepreneur. And so when I sit down with other entrepreneurs, I actually, um, I can empathize with the things that they're going through. Um, I also should tell you that um, you may have a really dumb idea, but there really are no dumb ideas. Because they're your ideas, and they're what you're passionate about. And if the venture guy, or the financier, or the person that you're pitching to doesn't get it, that's their problem. Now, if 15 of them don't get it, then maybe you might want to rethink your deal. <laughs> but not every one of them is going to get what you're doing, and they're not going to have your passion. You know, and. Um, and I just absolutely love entrepreneurs. I think um, I see a kindred spirit, and I think it's always important to respect the entrepreneurs. I was uh, meeting with a company earlier today, and I talked to them about how, you know, at least our firm, the track record is we try to stay with our founders as long as possible in the CEO role, preferably all the way through. And if they will grow with us and listen, then we're going to absolutely uh, get along fine. And if they will, um, examine their weaknesses. And what I do with my entrepreneurs is I try to help them understand not just their strengths, but where are your weaknesses? Where are you really bad? Because I know where I'm bad. My partners, when we had Asia Pacific Ventures, they wouldn't let me even review my own assistant. I was so bad at administration, they didn't want me doing anything. But I was really good at sales. And I brought in about 80% of our revenue. They wanted me out there. They knew what I was good at, and they knew what I wasn't good at. I'm not good at the detail stuff. I hate spreadsheets. I hate building I hate, I'll do it, but I really hate it. That's not my strength. So I sit down with my entrepreneurs, and I help them understand where they're strong and where they're weak. And then we sit back and we say, gosh, if your weaknesses aren't so problematic that I can't fund you, then let's get some people around you that make up for those weaknesses. And as long as you and I both understand what those weaknesses are, then we plug the right people in around you, whether they be advisors or board members or other management team members. And then the chances of success go up dramatically. So that's the kind of stuff we do. I think that's awesome. Because how many times a week would you say you go out and you visit companies, or how much of your time is spent helping your companies? Well, some of my companies aren't local. So, but I talk to my CEOs at least three times a week, two or three times a week. And, um, I visit everybody at least once a month, and if they're in town, <clears throat> it's the beauty of being in Palo Alto, by the way, most of my CE CEOs will cruise through, or some of their people will cruise through um, at least once every couple of weeks, so I can hook up with them. Um, I spend a lot of time hooking my management teams up with other companies. In fact, that's what I was doing today when you know I was on the phone. and. Uh, um, and so we do a lot of uh, introductions. We do a lot of help in the recruiting process. Um, you know, that's where we can help you know, get people cajoled to come on over and, and join a firm, join a fledgling, fledgling place, help CEOs learn how to recruit properly, uh, get them in the door of large companies. That's one of the Legis' big shticks is, you know, previously we had a lot of corporate money. And this isn't corporate retirement funds, but we had corporate direct off the balance sheet strategic money in our fund, with the thought being that we would then return strategic information back to them. And so these companies were looking for uh, information flow from us, deal flow. It's great. And so even to this day, I mean, Chevron hasn't been in one of my funds for almost 13 years. And yet I was able to get 
uh, two of my companies into Chevron today uh, with their IT department. It's a big deal, big opportunity. But you know, these relationships were forged a long time ago. So those are some of the things that we do as well. You try to give your companies an unfair advantage is basically what you're doing. Yeah, but you're amazing also at the networking. I think that's a definite skill set you have from what I've heard. <laughs> Most VCs have that skill set. I don't know, he's pretty it's exceptional. Not, it's not, and she's quite networked. I gotta tell you, I come in for one day, I'm meeting with the lieutenant governor, I'm meeting with the mayor, I'm meeting with all these very interesting people here. We had a good day today, I have to say. It was really, it was a great day, and Jay Larson in the back snuck in, ITC. Jay, thanks, Jay was with us for today too. It was some great discussions here, and how do we help build Boise, and how do we help each of you guys as entrepreneurs, you guys as investors, you know, and how do we bridge to Palo Alto and to Silicon Valley and stuff? Um, and that's a lot about what, what I'm about here in Boise. So you're talking about the entrepreneur, and you've seen <laughs> probably, not, you can't even count probably how many pitches, good and bad, that you've probably seen. But when you're looking and you're talking with these entrepreneurs, if the, how many of you guys out here are starting your own business or have your own business? Oh, awesome, awesome, good group tonight. Okay, so let's say down the road, or maybe now you're thinking of looking at funding, any type, angel, crowdfunding, VC, you know, personal friends, whatever you're looking for. Talk to us, at least from a VC standpoint, maybe even angel, because I know you do angel as well. Um, when, what you're looking for your company, what should they have lined up before they come to you guys? What do you look for, some tips for these guys? Well, let's talk about what I think are the three biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make. What are three biggest mistakes you can make before you come to look for funding from me? The biggest mistake or the thing you should avoid, you need to choose the right people to be with you on your team. And it's not your college roommate, sorry. It's just not. You know, that may have worked out for Bill Gates and those guys, but that's not how it works. You've got to choose people that absolutely will carry their piece of the load and they bring something to the table that you don't. I was successful with my consulting business because I had two partners that were absolutely spectacular people at skills that I wasn't good at. And as a result, the three of us just crushed it. And I, I mean, I, I was, I'm still blown away that we did that. Can't believe we did that. I thought I was gonna be back on the street looking for a job six months later. Your partners are your critical play because your VCs, they fund people. Not just ideas. You know, you drive down the highway, every grease spot you see was a good idea that never got funded, okay? They're all over the valley, too. You look at the companies that do well, it's based on execution and teams. We fund teams. I was telling Jessica earlier today, there's a guy um, <clears throat> that was a co-founder of Ironport, which is one of our larger um, exits, and we sold him to Cisco for a whole lot of money. And uh, Tom Gillis came out of there. He was running the security business for Cisco. He spun out. He got a group of guys together. And, and, and so his, the, the woman that was his CFO was working with him before. His, his marketing person working with him before. He probably had six or eight people. It was, it was kind of like the, the, the go-to team. And on Slideware alone, he raised $24 million in less than a month. And it was a fight to get in there. We were fighting to, with other guys to try to get our piece of that deal on Slideware. Why? Because Tom is awesome. And so were the people that he gathered. And they weren't his roommates, they weren't his cousin, they weren't his best friend. They were people who became friends through the effort of building a company. So that's the number one mistake you want to avoid. Can I ask you something before you move on to number two? So if we have a smaller community like we do here in Boise, and maybe some of you guys are struggling to find the right partners or anything like that, do you have any advice for those guys that are trying to build their team? It is. It is, but you can't compromise. You can't compromise, and you don't never settle. You know, I have this problem. So I invest outside of California quite a bit. I've got quite a few Utah companies, and I got smacked in the head recently by um, one of my co-board members on a company in Utah because I was I was saying, hey, yeah, that market VP, let's go ahead and hire her. And he took me to the woodshed. He said, why are you lowering your standards just because it's a company in Utah? It's going to take us two more months, but you're right. We shouldn't. It's a killer opportunity. We're not going to lower our standards. And I fall into that same trap. And so when you're looking, it takes a while. You know, get the, get the mentors that are in your area, people that have been there and done that, people that visit, 
Use that network. Find them. And, and you know, it's interesting if you look around your the companies where you work, sometimes there's a person you worked with in the past. You know, by golly, she was the smartest person. She's the most capable person I ever worked with. What's she doing now? LinkedIn, figure it out. But it is it is much easier said than done, and I don't want to make a pass say it's difficult, but don't settle. Because it is your team is absolutely critical uh, to getting funded. Yes. Is it okay to ask a question? Sure, go for it. <laughs> so this is a high topic for me right now in my company. By the way, I'm a vendor with bodybuilding.com and had a <laughs> meeting with Ryan Harris the couple, uh, about a month and a half ago. Here, I'll give you my mic. Um, so the question for you, Spencer, is um, I'm in a situation right now where I have um, two people I'm looking at to bring in as partners. And the big question for me is um, how much of the company do I give up? What are they bringing to the table? Expertise, no money. And are they going to do or are they going to just advise? No, they're going to do. They're going to be partners, so they're going to work. Okay, it depends on how bad you want them. You know, I mean, really. What stage is your company? Has it been formed yet or is it just getting formed? No, it's been formed for uh, two and a half years, going on three years. Right. But we're now in reformulation. So with just the branding, uh, the look, the feel, everything. So it's almost like a restart up again, if you will. So if they're awesome, be generous. What's generous? I mean, what's your cap structure right now? I'm, oh, I'm sorry. What, what is your cap structure right now in terms of ownership? I, I'm 100%. LNC, you're 100%. Yeah. And how big a company do you think you're going to build? Big. Very big. <laughs> it's massive. It's massive. Yeah. But lots of bodies down the road. You're going to raise yes. capital, et cetera. Right? Yes. So you know, I have seen um, I've seen guys come in and say, "Look, I'm the founder, so I'm going to have 51 percent, and you guys can split the other piece." But by golly, now you don't have a pool for anybody yeah, else. That's you. right. When are you going to build that pool? Well, if I give it away right now, which is obviously you know, let's say I give 40 percent away to those two partners, I'm 60 percent. So that is not a whole lot left to take me down to 51. Don't worry about the control thing. Okay. Don't worry about it. My best CEOs at Exit own 10% of their companies. But they built really big companies. Remember, don't look at the pie as finite. The pie isn't finite. It's a matter of how big the pie is, not the percentage ownership. Because that was is it, that is what then matters. So uh, um, Scott Weiss will tell you this. He's a partner over at Andreessen Horowitz. He was the CEO of Ironport. He raised a ton of money, probably raised, I don't know, probably $150 million by the time we got done with that deal. Um, and Scott retained 10% ownership in the company. We sold for $850 million. Scott made $85 million. I don't think he's whining that he got, if he owned 51% of $10 million, that's all he would have ever had, or maybe zero. You know, so you gotta really, I mean, if you truly believe that you can make a big company, I wouldn't get bent over in terms of percentage ownerships. However, Remember, that pie is going to continue to get split up, right? So if you split it up 60-40 right now, and the venture guy comes in and says, you know, I want to see I want to see my percentage, and then I want you to have an unallocated pool of 20% more. So then all of a sudden, your 60% looks like 40. That's still a massive, massive number. Okay, so right? this is also uh, this is also talked about. What about, uh, so there's 60-40, but a, but a VC comes in or capital comes in, and we all take the hit, not just myself. That's correct. Yeah. And, and the same would happen if you uh, build a pool, right? If you're at 60-40 and you build a pool of 20%, then your 60 is going to go down and it's going to be, you know, uh, 48 instead of 60, right? Because you're dropping 20%. That's right. pretty simple math. And so everybody, you know, but you're assuming that that pie is ever expanding. And I always tell entrepreneurs, don't get caught up in this. The pie is not finite. If you're a finite pie person, I don't want to fund you. Not interested in that. By the way, I don't want to come take your company. I typically, you know, at Exit, we'll come in and we'll try to own 20 to 25% of a company. Um, but at Exit, I don't know, 18%, 16, 17, we get diluted down too. And that's why we're putting more capital in. But we're not silly about it because if somebody else is going to put $30 million in at a higher price, I'm not going to go pro rat on that. My fund's not large enough, so I'll put a couple million dollars in at that price. I get diluted. It's okay. The pie's getting bigger. You know, 18% of a big number is a big number. 
<laughs> and if, you, if you don't mind, I know one of the big pieces is finding the right people on your team. And I always hear that's one of the number one things is finding the right partners, the right team members. And, you know, right now it's, it's fine. There's no money. But what about when there is a lot of money? And how do you, is it hard just to foretell the future, like your situation? Yes, it is. Okay. It's impossible. <laughs> the only thing your plans will ever be, I can guarantee you all your plans will be wrong. Now, whether it be wrong to the downside, wrong to the upside, they will be wrong. All your forecasts, you'll never hit a forecast. It's okay. You're going to try. You're going to shoot for it. Hopefully, you'll beat them. But, you know, they're never, it's not an exact science. There's a wet finger in the air right now, man. Where, where am I going to be in three years? Right? That's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. It's the beauty of building a company. You don't know how you're going to get there. You just know you're going to do it, you know. And then you get your team together and you make it happen. That's why the team is the most important piece. By the way, if somebody can bring the money, even if they're a butthead, okay, if you can keep the butthead in the box, you can deal with the butthead, right? Remember, it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't. Everybody has weaknesses, okay? And if some guy's a jerk or a challenging personality, it's okay. You can put them in a box and still deal with them, you know, um, if they bring value. And if they bring financing sources, that's a huge value because guess what? Companies go out of business when they run out of money. It's it. It's not when they make a bad decision. No, you can make a bad decision, you still have money. You run out of money, you're done. I don't care how good your idea is. So, you know, if somebody can bring the money, you are going to live with some interesting personality situations sometimes. <laughs> Thanks. So I want to go back to the number two and three on this list. Well, then the number two thing is um, don't underestimate the amount of capital it's going to take you to get there. I've Almost. seen this problem here. Well, it's, it's, it's in the valley as well, though not as much because you get more experienced guys that have been through it a couple of times. There's this adage out there in the marketplace called Lean Startup. How many of you heard of Lean Startup? Okay, so Eric Reese is a big component of this, is a co-founder of a company called InView. I'm still on the board of InView. Eric's a close friend of mine. Steve Blank, who is his big mentor, is a really close friend of mine. That was my second deal I ever did called Epiphany. So I've known these guys forever. I love the lean startup idea, but the second half of it is, is unrealistic. In other words, you can start your company lean, but I've never seen a company get there without raising boatloads of cash. You know? What's that? They just recently sold. They still raised $50 million to get there. Even as they started super efficiently with a quarter million dollars, half a million dollars, that's what the lean startup part is, is the startup piece. But what you have to do as an entrepreneur is you say, okay, I'm going to get my seed funding or my first round of funding. What am I going to accomplish over the 18 months of that cash you know, that cash will take, by the way, 18 months is the key, minimum 18 months of cash that you should raise for either a C or a Series A, gives you a full year of operations and then six months to get more money. Gives you three months worth of hiccups, okay? And they will happen. So 18 months is the bare minimum. If somebody as an angel comes in and gives you a year worth of cash, it's not enough, you need, you need more. And so when you look at this, you say, okay, well, gosh, we can get, I've had companies come and say, you know what, we're break even already. In fact, I met with a guy in Palo Alto last week. You know, we're, we're cash flow break even. You really want to look at this guy. I said, really? I don't think you are. Oh, we are. I can show you my balance sheet. Look, how much are you paying yourself and your co founder? What do you mean? Are you paying yourself a market salary? Oh, no, we've been doing sweat equity. <laughs> okay, well, then you're not break even, pal. And when you hire that marketing VP, what are you going to pay her? Are you going to pay her 100 grand? She's not going to come for that. Oh, right. So why don't you go back and redo your model with a fully fleshed out, fully baked, and fully costed business model so we can understand how much cash you really need. I'm not saying don't be lean. I'm saying at the start, of it, that's fine. But when you look at your capital needs on a go-forward basis, just more often than not, they're a lot more than the entrepreneurs think. So that's mistake number two. The third mistake that entrepreneurs make, and unfortunately, this one, sometimes you can't avoid. The third mistake entrepreneurs make is the kind of money they take. It's the only situation in your life where you get to hire your own boss, because nobody's going to put money in your company without control provisions attached. If I do a Series A investment and I own 20 
percent of your company, you cannot raise more money without my permission. You can't hire any of your senior staff without me saying okay to. Now, I can't force you to take anybody either. It's a you know it's a it's a joint kind of decision. But those are control for You can't sell your company unless I agree. You've given up a certain amount of control. Now I can't force you to sell the company either. You know, so I don't have control either, but there is a veto vote now. So you are hiring your own boss and because everybody runs out of money, when it comes to the next round of financing, we may say, you know what, pal, you're not cutting it. We've got to get somebody else to run this thing. That's just how it is. I'm sorry, it didn't work out. Let's find a role for you, or you hate me, I hate you, we're gonna find somebody else. I have to protect my investment. At the end of the day, I'm a fiduciary. You know, sometimes these decisions have to be made. I hate it when that happens, but sometimes they have to be made. So there's that inflection point, and that power comes at the financing round when you're out of money. Because I can't, I can't get rid of you until you're out of money. Oh, by the way, if you can raise more money without me, as a fiduciary, I can't keep you from raising money. That'd be stupid. I could be sued. So obviously, we'll let more money come to the company. But um, those inflection points, people coming into the company always want to know how the current investors feel. What do you think about this thing? Huh. What do you think about the CEO? When I get a call from like that by one of my CEOs, what do you think about that person? It just doesn't seem like a oh, shoot. Um, well, we've been discussing that situation and horse truck. Anyway, those are the kinds of things that come up. So, when you're choosing your financing partners, that's where some of the biggest mistakes are made. Some people chase names, some people chase a big pile of cash. Some people make this huge error of chasing valuation. Well, this guy's going to give me double the price that that VC guy is. <coughs> yeah, but he's a jerk. And you're going to hate him. You remember, you're hiring your own boss. You might hate that person. You don't know. So, when I finance you, guess what I do? I call all the people that have ever worked for you. I call all the people that you've worked for. I want to know what kind of person you are. And I go through LinkedIn and I do blind references that you don't know about. Because I need to know how you act when you're not around me. I'm about to give you a whole bunch of money and you're going to have control over that. That's a scary proposition. And if I don't know you, I got to do that diligence. Well, guys, you need to do the same diligence. If you got a hot idea and you put that, you did the first two, right? You got your hot team together, you got your plan set, now you got people, there's a bunch of us circling around your deal. Pick the one that you match up best with, okay? Mean doesn't change. It doesn't. And so when you do reference checks on your VCs, which you should, I want to talk to every one of your CEOs. And then you go on my profile on LinkedIn, you see all the companies I used to be on the board of, you say, oh, well, you didn't give me any of those. I'm going to call those old CEOs. Oh, crap, that deal died. I want to find out how he acted when that company went sideways. I want to know how that VC acts at, at his or her worst. You should know that. That's the third mistake that entrepreneurs often make. Now, the caveat is, at the end of the day, your company needs to be funded, and sometimes you have to take terms and money that aren't very pleasant. And you have to make do with what you can get. And I run across lots of deals like that. Um, and, you know, I usually get to be a cleanup guy. And they can be a challenge. In fact, she's going to ask me a question later, I think, that I can give you one of my stories about how, how one of these things came about and we had to clean it up. But those are the three big decisions that you can make big mistakes on, at least from my perspective. I think we hit it. Let's just hit it now. I don't even need to ask you. So I sold a company <laughs> in Utah last year called Solera Networks. Um, very nice uh, network forensics company. Solera, this is good. I think so. This is a kind of a good, will you take us through the start to the finish of Solera? Sure. That'd be great. This is a good outcome, and it's a good kind of case study is walking through the process. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Well, and Solera hits on all three of the problems I just mentioned. And I'll walk through them. I first met Solera four years before I put money in it. Great idea. Completely backbone or crazy founder. Unfundable. Super smart, but unfundable. And I'm not that bright a guy, but I have a really good antenna for, for crazy. And, <laughs> and I know when something's not going to work out on that side of things. And I don't want to go through 
the pain, even though I thought the idea was so cool. The forensics after somebody's broken into your network is critical. And these guys had technology that was just awesome. But the two guys running it were absolutely unfundable. So I walked. Um, four years later, the deal came back to me again. And a couple of VCs in Utah had funded this thing to the tune of $12 million. They had funded and refunded, booted the two founders, brought in a couple other guys. Technology is still really interesting. The company hadn't made much progress because they'd gone through all this foaming. So on somebody else's nickel, this thing came back to me. Well, when the deal came back to me, the venture capitalists involved on 84% of the company. Because they kept having to put more money in. And now, Common owns 16%. And it was a great opportunity for me because the fund didn't put money and didn't have much money left. I liked the two guys running it. They're just super smart. By the way, my, my daughter's a, like a high school soccer person and she's a really pretty decent player. And when she was a sophomore and got called up to the varsity team, I was kind of surprised. I told the coach, I said, I'm kind of surprised her footwork's not great. So why did you move her up to varsity? She got us to work on her footwork. He said, Spencer, I can teach footwork. I can't teach speed. And she's got wheels. And she just can't teach that. You can't make kids faster than they are. You can't teach smart. You can teach lots of skills, but you can't teach smart. And these two guys, Steve Schellenford and Joe Levy, oh, smart, really smart. Um, you can't teach that. So I was like, okay, got that. Well. I came in and I said, look, uh, they, they wanted to know what the pre-money valuation was going to be. I said, well, I'm not even going to give you a pre-money valuation. Here's what I want. I'm going to put five million bucks in for 30%. You guys, the current VC, you have to put two million in more. So we're going to do a seven million dollar round, but I get 30% and I want a 22% option pool for the management team right now. That took them from 84% down to 49, actually a little bit less than 49. And it took some cajoling, but they accepted it. And interestingly enough, in this case, it was a VC-owned company because the management team was brought in. The founders were long gone at this point, but these guys were so smart. And so we ended up giving them a lot more money and bumping up their stock over time. And so when the company was sold, even though we'd done two more rounds of financing with Intel and Trident Capital, the Commons still owned 26% of the company, actually more than what I originally set aside for them. Because they're what's going to make the company go. So we kept bumping that option pool up. And my 30%, and even though I kept putting more money in the company, my 30% went down to 20 over the period of time on the company. I didn't care. Right? So for $250 million, my 10 million bucks all of a sudden went, hey, 10 to 50, I can do that. I can do that math. And that's easy math. And so, um, and this was a company in Utah. Nobody else wanted to touch it because the, the cap table, the balance sheet, was, not the balance sheet, but the cap table was such a mess. Such a mess. But I did the work necessary to fix it. And as a result, we made a bunch of people a lot of money, a lot of the entrepreneurs a lot of money. And by the way, this is something else you should remember. If you guys are running a company and it gets bought by another company, the good news is the company buying you can give a rat's fanny about me. They don't care about the investors at all. They're going to give us the bare minimum to get us the heck out of Dodge, and they are going to come give you lots of love. Okay, so even in the Solar Networks case, there was at least another 30, and it depends upon how the ultimate ending goes, maybe as much as $45 million more that went just to management team and not to us at all. And what they did is they, they you know, sold, sold the company. They said, what's the bare minimum you guys will take to get out of the way? We told them, they bought it. And then after the fact, they went and took care of the management team. I knew this was going to take place. It's okay. I'm all right with it. So management made out even better. If you really take a look at it, they you know, it equated to management maybe owning as much as 40% of the company, which is great. I'm not complaining. I had a great return. That's how that kind of you know, deal came, came about. So, sorry. Well, they weren't. it wasn't just the management team that walked out well. Do you want to tell them a little about the rest of the... Oh, well, so? yeah, we had, I think we had 23 people that made at least a million bucks on that company out of the 140 employees. A lot of, everybody made a little bit of money, but we had 23 that were like newly branded millionaires. And what's great about that for the ecosystem isn't the million bucks, because the million bucks, you know, in Utah or even here in Idaho, right, 
You buy their house, take care of that mortgage. After taxes, you buy a car, you put some money away for the kids' college. All right, not a lot left, right? What does that mean? It means you want to go do it again. And out of the 23 people, there were only three of them that made what I call drop dead money, life changing money. And the others made enough to, to take care of a lot of immediate needs, bump them socioeconomically, but they want to go do it again. And it's great because now they're starting to spin out of the company that bought them. And I am the beneficiary of that. And I'm using them as advisors and other things. And the CEO, we're looking at a couple of deals right now where I want to drop him in. Because once again, now he's a made man. He is a made man, and people will fund wherever he goes. Yeah? Whatever happened to the two back one of crazy uh, founders? It's a good question. So the original VCs that funded them um, paid them off a couple million dollars each. And so they didn't walk away. I and mean, nobody's, nobody's opposed them. And then they both lost all their money doing other stuff. They were um, they're really smart guys, but some, some folks, um, they're not backable with funding, and, and part of a lot of it's because they don't um, they don't want to listen, you know. And well, you venture guys, I don't want to run your company. By the way, if I invest in your company, I don't want to reach over and grab your steering wheel. But if I say, hey, we're going a little fast here, there's a bad corner coming up. I know where the corner is. If you don't slow down, we're toast. And you choose not to slow down, we're done. Because while I may not be that smart, I have really good pattern recognition, and I know how the movie typically ends, and I'm trying to give you the ending before you make the mistake. And so I look for that kind of uh, you know openness from an entrepreneur. Because most of these guys that I fund, in fact, this is the most exciting thing about being a venture guy. I wake up every morning and I, you know don't tell my LPs this, but how to do it for free. Do you realize the guys? I sit in my office. The other day, a guy came in. Um, anybody know what the mothball fleet is sitting over in the bay? So there's all these World War II ships sitting over there. So their idea was they were going to move some of these ships over into the piers of San Francisco, okay? Tie into the power grid and then use a pumping system and create a data center that was cooled by the bay water. It was so cool. What a cool idea. Unfundable from my perspective, but. What a cool idea. And I just sat and he was got former Navy captains. How exciting is that? Just to sit there and see how somebody's mind works. Who would have thought of that? It's just great. Had this little guy come in, not a little guy, he's a nice guy, but very young, 28 year old kid, came in, works for the NSA. He and his partner wanted to crowdsource white hat hacking. Do you guys know what white hat hacking is? So when companies out there, they have these bounty programs where they pay for you to find vulnerabilities. These guys said, you know, we're going to institutionalize that because that's what we did in our spare time with the NSA. It's almost like gaming. And we're going to institutionalize that. We finance, I funded them immediately. They were so smart. And we were lucky to get in there. And a bunch of other firms did too. Awesome idea. Super smart. 28 years old, first time CEO. But so malleable because... His name's Jay Kaplan. Jay Kaplan knows what he knows. But the most important thing is he knows what he doesn't know. And when he doesn't know something, he's Mr. Input. We've helped him build out his team, we've gotten customers. Um, you know, we funded them last summer. They've already got two, you know, customers that are paying them more than a million dollars a year. Most SaaS companies, SaaS software companies, take a couple of years to get their first big customer. These guys have a bunch already in line. It's scary how exciting. Super, super smart guys, though. Super smart guys, yeah. So we're running short on time, but I do want to talk about um, Boise Local. We don't have much of a VC presence, a strong one here. And so a lot of people, I think, when they're looking at their companies and growing, their question is, what options do I have? Where do I go? There is, um, there's some angel presence here. Um, there's some, there, we just have a few different um investment opportunities in that sense. And I know you've done angel and the venture. Um, talk us through those in the room that do some angel investments. Advice. Well, first off, you have a blessing and a curse here. The curse is that you're not Silicon Valley. The blessing is that you're close enough, you're a flight away. Very short flight, right? So we, as a firm, we invest in the Southwest Corridor. That's wherever Southwest flies and comes back in the day, in my mind. And so we'll do Seattle to LA, San Diego, 
as far you know east as Boulder and Denver. I have one company out there. Um, we do quite a bit in Utah, um, and uh, so that geography works well for California-based VCs. But unless you have local presence, it's going to be really a challenge to get guys like me to come put money into this market because we need a local VC that can help us. I don't use the word babysit, but help us mentor these deals. I was telling Jessica, sometimes doing venture as a board member, having been an entrepreneur myself, it's like going on the Boy Scout camp out for five years. <laughs> I love this description. <laughs> because the, the IQ of the folks is really high. But the emotional IQ many times will dip into the teen years suddenly and then shoot back up. Have you ever gone to the airport and you sit there in line and there's you know a person in front of you and they've told you 500 times to get all of the liquids out of your bags, right? And invariably they still have a cell phone in their pocket and liquid in their bag. And you're like, what the heck? These people function in real life, don't they? Right? What is going on? Why is it our IQ drops when we go into the airport? If you're a seasoned traveler, you're like, really? Come on. I know you can drive a car. So it's not dissimilar in venture. When companies are financing, when we go through a liquidity event, oh my goodness, forks and knives come out, everybody's angry. And if everybody's equally angry, you probably got to the right number. <laughs> and even in good deals, there's quite a few objectives thrown across the table. Because all of us, our IQ drops 20 points, our snouts go down, elbows go out. We get really, really busy. And so that, you know, and these, these emotional IQs with all of us, they fluctuate. And so, you know, that's, that's part of the mentoring process. And so I need a local guy. Ron Hines was my uh, co-investor in Solar Networks. And he's a Signal Peak guy um, and he's local in Utah, former VP of uh, sales at uh, Novell. And then he ran a company called Phobos. So he's done the entrepreneurial thing. He's done the big company thing. He is just fantastic. I will co-invest with him anytime. He's just awesome. He does the stuff I hate doing too, but he's such a good mentor and he's so great to have local. And he's part of the reason we have a nice exit there. So that local presence is really critical and you guys don't have it right now. It's one of the things I told the Lieutenant Governor today. You need it. You need it because what happens is otherwise you're left to the angel community and the angel community tends to put terms out that are not favorable to you getting your next round of financing. And I don't know if there are any angels in the room, I won't call you out, but guys, if you're angel funding deals, your goal for these companies isn't for you to angel fund and hold all the stock and get an exit. That's not the goal. The goal is to help these companies get their Series A. And the angels in Silicon Valley, that's their whole focus. So when they get a term sheet down to the guys and they're doing the company, it's clean, super clean, and it's with an eye to, hey, you know what? This team is going to go out in 14 months, 15 months, and they're going to go for a Series A with venture guys. And I don't want anything from my side to be an impediment to that. So I'm not going to have 25% warrant coverage. I'm not going to put a put on the company. I'm not going to, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I've seen some pretty egregious things from angels in the past. I'm sure you guys experienced them to some degree. If you're an angel, if you know angels, please tell them. The goal is to help these companies get to their Series A so they get real venture money because the angels are not going to take you to the end. And I love angels, by the way. I'm very close with lots of the angel groups in the Valley, and we follow them into deals all the time. But they're not committed to this asset class. I am in the business of doing not just the Series A, but Series B, Series C, and on down to your liquidity event. Angels are not. They're typically investing their own money. So they're doing the seed. And maybe they'll do the A, but I don't feel good today. Maybe I won't do it today. Yeah, oh crap, the market tanked yesterday. I'm not going to do it. Well, because they're not committed to the asset class. I'm managing a pool of capital. My job is to put it to work. It doesn't matter what's going on in the general economy. And so to get that kind of professional money in, you need to have your company set up um, by the angels with as clean a term as possible. Just a suggestion. Because um, otherwise it's really challenging. If there's an impediment there on the term sheet, the VCs from outside, they already, you already got a strike against you because you're not in the valley. Um, and by the way, that little company I mentioned uh, with Jay Kaplan, the, the crowdsource funding is called SENAC. 
We made a move from Boston to Silicon Valley. We made a move. And I got another company we're funding out of Maryland. We're making a move. I can't do an East Coast play. They're coming to the Valley even though it's really expensive and hard to recruit people. But they're coming out. The good news here is if you can get a local venture presence, you won't have to move to the Valley. My Utah companies don't move to the Valley. They have an ecosystem now that's very healthy. They don't need Silicon Valley. Except for two things, I'll, I'll get to those in a second. But generally speaking, they don't need Silicon Valley. There's local money, um, and there's plenty of local talent. The positions that I do find very challenging to get outside of Silicon Valley um, are interesting enough that product management more than anything else. And when I say product management, I'm not talking about a brand manager. I'm talking about people who can write an engineering spec and go out and talk to customers and understand what the customer wants. Because the customers say and do are two different things. Oh yeah, I'll do that, I'll do No, you've got to dig down and know exactly what the customer is willing to part with money for. And then you put your, your product plan together and you spec it out. Because then you make your engineering VP into a superstar. And those product people are super, super hard to find. Because they have to be technical enough to be even a VP of engineering. But they have to be market savvy enough to be a VP of marketing. They're a unique animal. If you get one and you know they're good, man, give them a lot of stock and hold on to them. Because they're really hard to find. And the other one is, is good experienced CEOs. But you know, that's a completely different discussion. Well, I have so many more questions, but we're just about out of time now. We have five minutes. If we want to open up to questions now to you guys, because I bet you some of you guys came with questions. Yeah, here, I'll bring a mic. How do we get a VC here? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Can we cancel this flight? <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, the, you have some stuff going for you, though, right? I mean, Sun Valley's not far away. You know, um, there are a lot of venture guys who go to Utah because they have places in Deer Valley. There are plenty of venture guys who have places in Sun Valley. So, you know, you've got that going for you. So they're willing to visit, but you need a local presence. And I was, I was telling the folks in the Capitol today that whether it's a pool of money from the large corporations locally, by the way, you've got some big companies here. My goodness, you know? And if they want to, you know, uh, help assist in the building of this ecosystem, maybe you can put a pool of capital together and find uh, two or three people to, to run that with the thought that we're going to put this money to work locally. I know this was tried before with the Highway 12 experiment. experiment. But it's interesting, in, in Highway 12's case, you know, the state here put a ton of money in their fund, and Utah put only $5 million bucks in their fund, and they did 80% of their deals in Utah. And part of that is because that big chunk of money that they got from the state, if, they, if they'd been smarter about it, it would have been spread across a whole bunch of venture funds outside the state, and maybe just $5 million to them locally. And then those other venture funds would be compelled to come and look at stuff. And then they got a local partner to... Uh, you know, coordinate with and co-invest with. Um, so it's it's not a simple answer, but I do believe in order to create the ecosystem that you guys are talking about here, there needs to be a local fund. It doesn't have to be massive. Even if it was forty or fifty million dollars, it would be enough because it could get that Series A done, and you know, then guys like me would come in and follow that if people were willing, you know, to help us work on the deals. It doesn't have to be a huge pool of capital, but it needs to be local, and it needs to be focused on, on local deals. So if we get to work, and we can pull this together in a community, will you visit us again and help this group out? Yeah, well, I have a cabin in the Highland Park, and I realize yes. that's on the other side of the state, but I'm, a, I'm an Idaho boy at, at, at heart. My dad grew up in a little bitty town called Rigby on the other side of the state, so um, yeah, I'm a... Yeah, I'm very fond of Idaho, so I would love to have a reason to come to Idaho. Okay, you guys, we just heard that here tonight. He's committed to us. We're going to go to work now, Spencer. Judy, do you have a question? Please, can you elaborate a little on pre-money valuation? Well, so don't worry about pre-money, because that's not what matters, okay? If you're looking at venture guys coming into your deal, I'm talking not seed, right? Seed is a different negotiation. But if you're talking about my money coming in, I'm going to syndicate. 
And I'm not going to take an out-of-state board seat unless I own at least 20%. And I want my syndicate partner to own at least 20%. Otherwise, we're not predators enough to help your deal out. So get your head around 40%. 40 to maybe even 45. Get your head around that. Now, as an entrepreneur, instead of worrying about the percentage, focus on how much money I can get for that 40 to 45 percent. And that's how you get to your free money. So instead of sitting there saying, oh, I only want to give up 20 percent of my company, well, good luck. Because I'm not getting on a plane and flying out here every six weeks and pounding my family to own 8 percent or 10 percent of your company. It's not worth it. I can't do it. So I have to own more in order to make it worthwhile. And so other VCs will be the same. And since there's not a venture ecosystem here, that's the percentage you gotta give up. So the question is, how much money can I, can I get seven million bucks for that? Can I get eight million bucks for that? You know, if you got, if you got eight million instead of five for that same 40 to 45% dilution, you win, right? You got an extra three million bucks for the same dilution. So that's what determined, I mean, I think people wrapping their heads around what the cap table looks like is the most important part. And then going after how much money I can get. Now, at a minimum, you want to raise enough for 18 months. Preferably 20, but 18 months is the bare minimum. It gives you a year to run like heck. It gives you a whole quarter worth of mistakes you can make. And then a whole quarter to you know, get yourself financed. Because if you make a mistake and you write the ship at month nine, that gives you two whole quarters to show six months worth of, hey, we kicked fannies and now I'm out raising money. Yeah, we turned the corner. So 18 months is the bare minimum. Um, question, last question. Yeah. No, it's here. It's yeah, you, yeah, you mentioned about uh, you're, looking, you're looking for CEOs who can learn and you're provoking memories of a back one of crazy co-founder I had who was like the MacGyver on brain steroids, but, and he would listen, and he would listen, but he didn't learn. And it took a while to figure this out. How do you get a handle on who's going to listen, who's going to learn, and who's not going to? A lot of times we don't. You know, I mean, some of my biggest mistakes. In fact, today I was I was on the phone with a company that um, we're going to end up losing money on, and it's one hundred percent my fault because I should never have backed the guy and his co-founder. Should never have backed. And you know, I didn't listen to the signals. I had a chance to sell that company after our first round. 18 months in, they were out of money, and the company in the valley offered them uh, 50 million dollars. And I owned 20 percent of the company. I had a million bucks in it. So that would give me, you know, a little bit more than 10 million bucks um, for the company for my three million dollars in. But that wasn't going to move the dial on my fund. And so I said, no, let's not do this, let's run harder. Because this, this set of entrepreneurs had sold a company previously, and they promised me when I funded them, hey, we're going for the long ball here. We don't want to sell out early. So I was kind of shocked that they wanted to sell early. So I asked them, what's wrong? Is our software not working? Is the market not developed? No, no, Spencer, it's all great. Why do you want to sell for 50 million bucks? What's going on here? And my antenna is doing this, and I'm not listening to it. 100% my fault. We went on down the road, and blew through a whole lot more. So I'm still capable of making mistakes as venture guy. And by the way, I'm willing to. That's why you call it venture. It's not, this isn't investment banking. This is venture. It's not <laughs> private equity where they, you know, it's, we're not financial engineers. You know, this is a people business. So made a mistake there. But most of the time, I can tell crazy. And I can tell whether they, they're going to listen and then not do, or whether they're going to listen and do. I have a good sense for that. And you have your partners too. You know, I have this one partner. His name is Jean-Louis Nesse. He's a very famous guy. He used to run Apple way, way, way back then. He opened Apple France and then came over and ran Apple during the craziest time of Steve Jobs and launched all the color Max and stuff. And then he did a company um, called B Software that went public. And he sat on the board of Cray Computer and, and uh, um, he was the chairman of Palm. And he, he's just, you know, really. Uh, a storied guy in his late 60s now, and he's my partner. Gasse has one of the best antennas I know. And he's a little diesel. Okay, that guy's done. And he knows, you know, he's got a great antenna, and I, you know, I really uh, you know, rely on that sometimes. So, thank you. Your partner's help.
Well, thank you so much. How about a round of applause for Spencer? Thank you. That was awesome.